thank you all for coming. Welcome to <laughs> welcome to 28 years of EverQuest development. Uh, in case you haven't seen it, which I'm pretty sure you've all have, here's our Year of Dark Paw logo right up there on the screen. Let's get straight into it, shall we? All right, so exciting fact. Over 5,144 centuries have been pe spent playing EverQuest. Think about that. Think about that. Let that sit in for a moment. That's over 500 millennia of people playing EverQuest. So, uh, we just released this sizzle, uh, sizzle reel featuring some of the most iconic moments for the past 25 years of EverQuest. I get chills every time I see that. <laughs> Still get chills. So, I know we just started straight in, so who are we? Well, I'm Jen Chan, I'm the head of studios, uh, so EverQuest 1, EverQuest 2, and the new EverQuest game. Hi, I'm Adam Bell, the design manager at EverQuest 1. And I'm Lucy McLaurin, I'm the engineering manager for EverQuest. <laughs> Our little avatars there. No, that is not actual representation of us. <laughs> so, what are we talking about today? Uh, well, we're going to go into the secrets of making EverQuest. And we're going to talk about, in the beginning, pre-pitch, and with that, the emergence of the concept, brainstorming and vision, and some technical challenges and solutions back then. Additionally, we're going to get down to the nuts and bolts. Uh, this is talking about development pre-launch. We'll be talking about some of the technical innovations, the world building, the artistic direction, some gameplay systems, uh, gameplay and systems, as well as beta and player feedback. Next, we'll move into ODark30, some stories from launch. We'll talk about the launch day itself and all the madness with it. Uh, part of the player reception of, you know, just this iconic brand. Uh, the industry influence and some cultural impacts that we've had. And then we'll move in to the rest is history. Uh, Post-launch, uh, we'll be talking about social dynamics, customer service, deployments under the hood. And then we'll move into continuing the legacy. A few uh, selected stories of uh, Runes of Kunark, the progression servers, going free to play in 2012, fanfares, and the 25th anniversary, which you're all helping us celebrate right now. And then we'll talk a little bit about the future and beyond. We'll talk about continued development on EverQuest, as well as a little bit about the new EverQuest game. So. In the beginning, pre-pitch. Take it over, Adam. So yeah, so the original concept um, came from the popularity of early massively on-player role-playing games, such as Gemstone 3 and Ultimate Online, and the developing 3D graphics space. Um, for those that don't know, Gemstone 3 was a text-based multiplayer role-playing game, also known as a MUD. Uh, for those that don't know what a MUD is, they were text-based games very much like the old RPGs 
And we went from room to room and encountered monsters or events. Um, and they're also sort of like large tabletop games where multiple players interact with each other and work together. Um, and there was very little art or visuals, if any, with these classic MUDs. I myself happened to play Gemstone 3, which was a text-placed MUD, and I was an empath in the, the lobby just healing everybody and losing my limbs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I myself, uh, I played a bunch of MUDs, but the one that I remember most visit vividly, that I can't even remember the name now, was a werewolf MUD. Uh, and it had a graphical interface in that, uh, you know, Back in the old days, MUDs, you just type in all your commands, your directions, your movement, everything. And, but this one was revolutionary in that it had uh, uh, buttons on the side that would allow you to move your directions, you know, north, south, east, west, up, down. So it was graphical MUD. <laughs> so yeah, much, many of the in concepts that inspired EverQuest were from uh, Daiku MUD and its derivatives. Um, and then we brainstormed. Uh, so in 1993, uh, online services were a novelty, and, but John Smedley saw their potential. Um, inspired by the primitive 3D game multiplayer mech game, he dreamed of crafting an online game like it. Um, Smedley's vision found support at Sony Interactive Studios America, which granted him funds to form a PC development team. Uh, collaborating with Brad McQuaid and Steve Clover, Smedley united his experience with McQuaid's creative insight McQuaid and Clover embraced opportunity, leaving their IT jobs to join, join SISA in 1996. Uh, McQuaid, drawn to MUDs, envisioned a novel approach of merging 3D graphics with MUD mechanics. Um, their blueprint for graphical MUD, documented a, in a 20-page design document, introduced class-based combat, player-versus-player -player environment, and the fantasy world named Norath, christened as EverQuest. Um, this convergence of vision and innovation laid the foundation for a revolutionary, massively multiplayer online role-playing game. So Lucy, what were the early technical challenges like? So a few years before EverQuest, we had a game called Tanneris, which if you're unfamiliar, yeah. Um, <laughs> Tanneris was an online multiplayer battle tanks game. And if you look at this screenshot, it actually looks strikingly similar to EverQuest because this is what EQ kind of used as its early architecture. Um, I think a big reason why EQ was successful initially is because we had Tanneris to build off of. Uh, the networking code in Tanneris was lifted directly to use in EQ. And I guess another kind of Easter egg thing would be that we still use mostly the original Tanneris code for missiles. So when you think about like a magician bolt, that's a missile. Um, and yeah, that's all still there. <laughs> and it's still called a missile in code. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, sorry. <laughs> Don't look up. Okay. Uh, so let's get down to the nuts and bolts. So EverQuest launched with, oh no. EverQuest launched with 70 zones. Uh, Lucy, tell me a little bit about how we managed to do that with our technical innovations. Yeah, so one of the special things that EQ had very early on was something called Reliable UDP, which was developed for EQ by this programmer named Vince Heron. Um, so there's two main types of network protocols, TCP, which is reliable, but not fast enough for an online game, especially one that came out in 1999. Um, and then there's also UDP, which is fast, but less reliable. So the difference here being reliable UDP that EQ uses has something called a not acknowledged packet, where if the client or the server is expecting to receive a packet and doesn't get it, it will request it again. So we are able to use something that is fast, like UDP, and it's still also somewhat reliable. Yes. Um, so then we started building our world. Um, so much of the game that launched was inspired by Bill Trost's personal D&D &D campaign that he game mastered as a kid. Um, and not being professional game developers, the original designers didn't know what they couldn't do, so they weren't constrained by known best practices. Uh, they implicitly knew to make sure that there were well-established core pillars. 
Decades later, as we've put words to those felt but not spoken ideas, such as grounding our gain in, in community and teamwork, fairness, escape, and exploration. Part of that was accidentally making sure that in some way, shape, or form, we were building worlds for everybody, like the Bartles players type of types shown there, uh, the killers, the explorers, the socializers, the achievers. Um, and in EverQuest's case, we have the player versus environment versus player. Um, the original development team also played D&D scenarios as a way to brainstorm and hash out the story. This is also why we can see certain characters in the game today that were directly based on their D&D characters, like Eridun. Part of the reason why they were so successful was because they worked on one zone until it was fully working and then built other zones on top of that. Currently, we call that vertical slices. Um, a concept that they were unknowingly during, doing during the early development years. And part of world building is about the art. So Jen, what inspired the artistic direction of EverQuest? So looking back at the landscape of fantasy, high fantasy at the time, you know, everything was very gray. Everything was very brown, right? A lot of stone, a lot of wood, right? And not a whole lot of color. And so the original team wanted to have a sense of vibrancy with the world, uh, something visually just enticing to look at instead of like, oh, here's another stone, here's another rock, <laughs> here's some more stones. <laughs> uh, so the original team, with that sense of vibrancy, also wanted it to have a comedic tone at the same time. So such as the trolls uh, in their idle animations, you know, trolls, you know, just gritty, very, very visceral, uh, almost uh, a gross feeling to them. But also, when they would idle, they would scratch their butt. <laughs> so, you know, the visual, but also comedic tone. And then here's some other images of old school EQ. There's Kinos. I know stone wood, but at least, <laughs> at least there's a building that's not like dark wood. Uh, <laughs> But Kelethin, look at that scroll working on the sides of the, how, of the buildings and, of course, the bridges. I don't know how many times I dropped off falling off the bridges when I first started. <laughs> and then, you know, here's, uh, here's a photo from North Karana. So a little bit of yellows, a little bit of highlights here. So that way it's a little bit more immersive and less brown and gray. <laughs> So the gameplay systems. Uh, the developers wanted to bring to life traditional pen and paper RPGs. They wanted to be able to see the monsters they were battling, engage in combat in real time instead of waiting for rolls and hand, hand calculating all the math and table lookups. They also created some out of the box ideas that gave EverQuest its characters, such as requiring players to go and collect your corpse to retrieve your items or experience or leave it to rot and be lost to time. <laughs> um, and the current basis for our combat system is still a die 20 roll, just like the original D&D. But the formula is quite a bit more complex than you see in D&D. And our treasure tables, they use the D100, just like D&D. Um, and then they launched beta. During beta, they got the, feed, the player feedback. Internal tests are one thing, but numbers matter. No matter the size of your development team, be it a one-man indie to a 500-person AAA development team, there are relatively few developers compared to the player base of these games. The teams will only think of a limited number of different ways of doing things, but bring in thousands to millions of players, and they will think of way more ways to test and break the game than you would ever imagine, which Betas are just so important because of that. Uh, so players were brought in and continued to bring in great ideas that help make the game more immersive. Uh, for example, setting up their own marketplace and economy in the game, such as the East Commons Tunnel. Um, and they just did totally unplanned things, like feign splitting, where a monk or other class that, could be, that can play dead would aggro an NPC in a group, run away a bit, then play dead. And this would lead to the NPCs going home but one would be a little further out and you could snag it when it was far enough away to not be in the call to help range of other NPCs. Um, therefore, you got one out of three. 
Um, and there were multiple rounds of beta testing to get more and more players in the game to test the gameplay and the server performance. I myself started gameplay in the fourth phase of beta. And then we had launch. So launch. ODark30, as you see this slide titled. So what does ODark30 refer to? Well, it's waking up well before dawn, and it's sometime that's so early you don't even know what time it is. It's like, uh, it's 30 something. It's ODark30 something. So now, let's go back to launch. Let's all go back to March 16th, 1999. Bring yourself back to those years. I don't know what you were doing at the time, but I certainly wasn't planning on working. <laughs> so yeah, I wasn't on the team back then, so luckily I wasn't working, but certainly, definitely preparing for a major launch. And so we launched March 16th, 1999. And within 24 hours, we had over 10,000 subscribers. And at that time, it made it the highest selling online role playing game up until that point. Well, within 24 hours, of course. Uh, and at the peak, we had about 400,000 subscribers. And we tend to keep our numbers pretty close to the vest, but we are able to say that we currently have about 80,000 uh, monthly active users, and that number will grow when we launch our time lock progression servers in May. In fact, I think it's even 90 right now with all of our anniversary events. <laughs> And then we had players lined up out of stores waiting to buy a copy, which only foreshadowed the immense flood of upcoming players. Lucy, I think you t uh, told us a story. You have a story about that fun time? <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't start playing right at lunch, but I do remember going to Fry's and just seeing like a mountain of EverQuest boxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, interesting part is you know, Lucy's, Lucy is a multi-generational gamer. Her father actually got her into EverQuest, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I always find that interesting that so many of us that are on the team, there, we're multi-generational EverQuest uh, fans and players. I know so many people on the team that it's like, yeah, my mother used to play. Yeah, my father used to play. Or they still play now, and that's, and they, now they work on the game. <laughs> so. And then, yeah, uh, when the servers first came up on launch day, they crashed due to the load. And they kept crashing. And we were doing everything we could to keep rebooting them and getting players back online. But again, think 1999. Back in the day, remote monitoring and controls weren't as sophisticated as they are today now, right? So to keep the servers running, we had people in our server room with the AC on max, and it was so cold in there, people had to wear parkas. <laughs> and they were monitoring the servers and rebooting them whenever they went down. Like, oh, that one's down. Okay, I'll go do it now. I'll go take my gloves off so I can actually use the keyboard because my hands are too frozen without the gloves. <laughs> and then you also have to remember that that was back when mechanical drives were the norms for servers. No SSDs back then. So anytime you're reading or writing to the hard disk, you're literally moving a needle back and forth over uh, a platter. Well, one day, the hard drives were working so hard to continuously write and read from these hard drives that it literally melted the drives. Like, so what happened was uh, the techs were wondering, why couldn't they reboot the server? What's going on? And so they pulled the hard drive out. And when they pulled it out, they had literally fused together m melted metal of the hard drive stuck in position. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I guess we need to rebuild that server now. <laughs> but, and yeah, and soon after launch, we also uh, basically DDoSed the internet into San Diego. So at the time, we were with a business internet service called, a uh, provider called UUNet. UUNet also provided the internet for a lot of major companies in San Diego. And so when we launched, there were so many people trying to come in and get, and get on the servers and play that the network load for UUNet hit critical levels and not only brought down our game, but brought down all these other companies' internet as well. <laughs> And then, although the launch was filled with challenges, uh, the, revolutionary, uh, 
The revolutionary nature of the game kept players intrigued and hanging on in order to explore the game's most immersive world, intricate mechanics, and social dynamics. Uh, and the game even gained the nickname Evercrack due to the popularity and the sheer draw of people exploring it and playing for hours on end. Uh, so Lucy, you had a memory about EverQuest? Um, first time? <laughs> so the first time I played, uh, my brother got encouraged to play by his high school classmate, and I did everything he did. And we opened the box and there's this card that says like, okay, this is how you like move your character, A, turn attack on, age hail. Um, he, he made a ear date shadow knight. You, we zone into Paniel, you can't see anything. Um, he just like moves forward and we saw a guard. And we're like, okay, well, just attack it. So he attacked the guard and he just died instantly and we were like, whoa, this game is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so EverQuest uh, rapid ascent to popularity ignited a cultural phenomenon. Um, we sold 60,000 copies by April 1999, doubling Ultima Online's record sales in just six months. The blend of intricate gameplay and stunning visuals transcended its challenging mechanics. Uh, players formed profound online relationships, effectively shaping the game's evolution and forging a passionate community. EverQuest had become a household name in the industry and was the topic of conversation for decades to come. So how did it affect the industry? Well, thank you for asking, Adam. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, due to the immense popularity of EverQuest, we set the standard for so many things that people consider, well, of course it works that way. That's how it's always worked. But no, uh, for example, ding, you know, that famous term for I've just leveled up <laughs> or you've just leveled up Congrats. <laughs> uh, and so that term is used throughout so many different games now. And it's like, what do you mean ding? <laughs> and it's like, there's no sound when they level up. There's, not, there's some sparkles when they level up, but there's no ding. But they still say ding. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and then two big MMOs today, World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy, uh, 10 have publicly stated that EverQuest strongly influenced their creation of their games. Uh, in fact, Final Fantasy, uh, for Final Fantasy 10, uh, 11, uh, playing EverQuest was their job for uh, the first few months in the beginning of the development of Final Fantasy 11. And for the WoW team, Many of them were early hardcore EQ players and major guild and raid leaders in early game. Like Fuhrer. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Yep, see, you all know. <laughs> and so let's talk about the rest of history. The rest is history. So Lucy. Will you tell us about, uh, ooh, why is my scroll wheel all weird? <laughs> tell us about the social dynamics. Um, so a big part of why EverQuest was successful is because of all of the social interesting things that happened. Um, players formed guilds, there's a thriving trade economy in places like the East Common Lands, players made fan websites. Um, there was little to no documentation in games, so uh, that arose to some urban legends. Um, some players were mostly on their own to figure things out. Sometimes they were right, sometimes they were not right. And I think one of the funniest examples is probably the ancient Cyclops. Um, so if you don't know what that is, the ancient Cyclops is a rare spawn in the southern desert of Roe that mystified players in terms of how to get him to show up uh, for many years. And there's a lot of uniquely named NPCs in that zone. And so players started to believe that if they killed this thing in this place, in this order, then they would get the ancient Cyclops to spawn. And um, many, many years later, it was revealed that it was just a simple spawn table um, that was shared with a few other NPCs, like Sand Giant, and the ancient Cyclops could only spawn at night. So it was actually like really simple. Um, one of the other interesting social aspects of early earlier EQ was um, in-game events like player weddings. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys went to an in-game wedding, or a few, 
Um, and then also GM events that were run by customer service when they finished all of their CS tickets, um, doing things like turning into an NPC and then having players kill you, just really creating dynamic in-game content. And uh, there's also the guide program that would run in-game events and help players and officiate weddings. And the guide program is still running in-game events today. Um, one of the other important significant events in EQ was when the sleeper was killed. Um, so if, and just really quick, if you don't know what the sleeper is, um, in Sleeper's Tomb, there is a uh, the un considered unkillable dragon asleep, and if you kill his four warders, then he wakes up, rampages through the zone, rampages across Velius, into Sky Shrine, fights your Lord Yelenak, and then flies away. Um, and so, uh, in 2003, on the Rallis X server, which is extra special because that was the PvP server, um, where there's not that much cooperation, um, more than 300 players banded together to kill the sleeper. And they got him down to 27%, and then the development team despawned it, um, which caused a lot of uh, upset. The, so the dev team did that because they suspected that an exploit was being used to kill the sleeper, and after investigating, they were like, no, that's not actually the case. So they apologized and respawned the sleeper, and three days later, the guilds came back and killed him after more than three hours. Um, so that was an awesome kind of EQ event. And then I think overall, part of why EQ lasted la and continues to last so long is because it's sticky. Um, so stickiness is something that is really important for a game's survival. Um, and it's basically like logging in, you group with somebody, you have a good time, and then you're like, okay, I have to go. And they're like, are you gonna be here tomorrow? Um, and things like that happening over and over until you have like friends and raids and responsibilities and all of a sudden EQ is your second job. Um, but <laughs> because you'd really depended on other players, it really made it a well-connected community and it really made people keep coming back again and again. Um, and, and then to like side mention that Asking for help was a lot easier to do in game than it in out of game because you'd have to, you know, full screen game, you have to log all the way out. Um, Google was in, in its infancy, maybe, so you wouldn't have found a lot of EQ stuff just by Googling things. Um, and it was a lot easier to just ask in, like, out of character, like, where do I go at this level? Where do I buy my spells? Um, and that kind of thing. But yeah, overall, a lot of EQ players became lifelong friends. So also at the time, customer service as it is today didn't really exist for games. The games would be on a disc or a stack of floppies or whatever. They'd come out and what was shipped was it. It was done. The most customer service you might get is maybe someone that might help you install it if you had some installation problems. But, out, but issues with the game? Nope. Um, but EverQuest is a continuing game with lots of online presence, so we started customer service. Um, we created a team spe specifically dedicated to resolving in-game issues. For example, if a player lost or accidentally destroyed an item, the CS team would help them find it or possibly replace it. Um, and they, as mentioned before, they also acted as game masters where they would run events and quests for the players. Um, the game masters have turned into a volunteer program where passionate players now run the events for other players. Um, and EverQuest was the first MMO to dedicate serious staffing to those activities. Um, at the time, there was an area at the company offices called the pit, where hundreds of customer service reps were in a one large room in small cubicles, giving both phone and online support, and in the center was a raised platform with the CS managers. Um, and I mentioned at the time that games came out on physical media, how did EverQuest deploy? Well, so EverQuest deployed on physical CDs, um, and if you were even if you were even able to get patches from other games at the time, they would be tiny, slow to download, or in some cases sent to you on a floppy disk. And with EverQuest, we needed the ability to push out patches and ensure that people were running the latest patch before they entered the world, or else you know their client could be incompatible with the servers. So I don't know how many of you remember trying to download multi-megabyte files back then. You know, on 28.8K modems, oh, 
so brutal. And if you didn't, if you weren't lucky enough to have like a second line, if someone picked up the phone while you were downloading, it would interrupt the download and you'd have to start the whole download again. But <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Restarting hours of downloading. So yeah, to resolve that, uh, we developed the ability to break up large files into smaller downloadables that were then reassembled automatically. I know, pretty normal stuff today, but back then it was like, what? <laughs> And so if you were in the midst of downloading a large update and for some reason it was interrupted, uh, you could resume uh, without relatively uh, few download time lost. So instead of our patches coming out, it's like, oh, I'm going to be downloading for the next four days. It's like, okay, I'm gonna download as much as I can now. Oh, somebody needs the phone, I'm gonna stop this download and then uh, come back and instead of having to restart all the time, it's like, okay, I only lost a f uh, like a few minutes of downloading. So, uh, my mouse, okay, good. <laughs> So let's talk about under the hood, Lucy. Look at that beautiful UI. <laughs> the, the <laughs> I feel like maybe someone made a custom UI that is like, like this. Um, <laughs> the lag meter is in Tanneris too, by the way. Um, okay, so EQ clearly was not designed to last as long as it has. Um, and so a lot of things had to be updated over the years to keep things going. In 2001, DirectX 8, uh, and then DirectX 9 following shortly after. Um, in more recent years, we added a new UI engine last year. And then just over the whole time, performance improvements so you could view more things, things that looked nicer, uh, better graphics, and that kind of a thing. Um, and tw so originally, EQ characters were stored in flat files, pretty much and you could only access a character with their account information. That made stuff like changing every character in the game pretty much impossible. Um, so in 2016, we converted character flat files into a character database for the first time. So that was a really big kind of monumental project um, before I worked there. And it really makes it a lot easier to do things to every character in the game when we need to do stuff like that. Um, another part of EQ's kind of technical stuff that has changed over the years would be um, variable sizes. So um, if you remember the original stat cap was 255, which is the largest number of an 8-bit variable. And NPCs had at most around 32,000 hit points, which is the largest value for a 16-bit variable. And what happened was when players started to get powerful enough that they could kill something with 32k hit points quickly, um, the design team had to get kind of creative with how to make it so something was still challenging. So uh, an example of that would be that the original Vichon's Peak NPC regen was basically the, high enough that you couldn't kill things unless you brought enough players that the zone lagged. And that was the only way you could kill anything in Vichon's Peak. <laughs> um, and then when Velius came out, the NPC hit point cap was raised to 32-bit. And that made raids just so much more interesting because you had all these things that you could fight for much, much longer. Um, so that was a massively positive experience to have change. And then um, in 2017, when we were working on Ring of Scale, we ran into the 32-bit hit point cap, and now it is 64-bit. Crazy, 64 bits of HP. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's cover continuing the legacy now. So with the first thing of continuing the legacy, can't, can't talk about that without talking about our very first expansion, the Runes of Kunark. So because of the massive, su massive success of EverQuest, it was clear we needed to continue expanding the world. I mean, imagine if we had this many players and you only had classic EQ all the time, year after year, no. That's, that's just way too small, right? <laughs> and so, yeah, in April 2000, we launched the first expansion for EverQuest, the Runes of Kunark, and this, in this expansion, we visited whole new lands while introducing new creatures to encounter. And in the expansions to follow, the 30 expansions later, we also added in new features like the alternate advancement system, uh, 
where you could gain new abilities, increase your character stats, and then later on, we allowed you to consume points uh, for unique temporary boosts. And the AA system and numerous other features that we've added over the years added more depth in customizing your own personal character and customizing your play experience. And so we haven't stopped shifting expansion since. Uh, in December, we launched our 30th expansion. So, 30 expansions. Woo, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the other cool things that you started doing, uh, I guess what happened kind of was a lot of players in around, I don't know, as, I don't know, as soon as it was not 2001 anymore, players started saying, bring back the old game, we want to replay the old game. And, um, what, what ended up happening was in 2006, they came out with two progression servers called the Combine and the Sleeper. And these were servers that started in Classic with a level 50 cap, and as players beat expansions, they would unlock automatically. And since then, uh, they were very successful, and since then they've been iterated on, more quality of life improvements like pick zones and more instance content um, have been added. Um, I think part of why they're popular is because it's very nostalgic. You get to experience something that maybe you didn't the first time because you were a big noob like I was. Um, and then we've also added kind of flavor on top of the normal game. So things like the randomized loot server and uh, level lock progression. Cool. So in 2012, we decided to try free to play. Um, EverQuest added the option to play EverQuest for free at a time when many other online MMOs were doing the same, either at launch or shortly thereafter. Without a subscription, they were still able to jump into the game and enjoy it. This newer model has proven motivational for game companies and players alike. Free to play gave more players the opportunity to experience the world of Norath without having to purchase the game. This was shown to be beneficial to the overall health of the game by increasing the pool of people to play with and players were also able to retain and even increase their social inter interactions and playtime. Jen, you worked on free-to-play. I did. And going free-to-play was a nail-biting release for us. I would say it was one of the most down-to-the-wire releases that we've ever had in the history of the game. And leading up to the release, anticipating a huge flood of people, uh, we started re replacing and upgrading the server hardware. So this was a multi-week process, moving one world at a time to the newer hardware. And before we had character, uh, this was before we had characters stored in a database. So with each server move, we'd have to shut down the server, copy all of the character files, literally files with uh, each character's name. It was like, I don't know, lujas.pc in this four folder deep structure. And so we shut down the server, we'd literally copy everyone's uh, character files and guilds and fellowships and all that stuff over the network. And then, so finally, after about four weeks of migration, the last one was aligned with when we were launching Free to Play. And with all of the hype, uh, we also decided that we were gonna make a countdown clock. We were gonna make a countdown down clock to the anniversary when we would unlock the servers. I don't know if you've ever had to do anything with a visible countdown clock running in your face. <laughs> True. <laughs> and so about 20 minutes uh, before unlock, I'd been working for about 38 hours straight in preparation, and someone realized that there was a critical issue on the servers. And I, I mean, we were able to fix it right then and there, but you know, that takes time. And so there's about three minutes to spare, and it's like, okay, this seems good. I think we're okay to unlock with three minutes to spare. <laughs> and so I'm staring at everything and going, let me double check this, let me double check that, while three minutes on the clock are clicking, uh, you know, counting down. And I can tell you those three minutes were possibly the longest three minutes of my life. I am just trying to read everything as fast as possible, and it's like, Okay, okay, I think we're okay. Are, are we okay? <laughs> and, you know, after it unlocked, you know, we unlocked fine, everything was good, there were no major issues. And after it unlocked, we completed our tests and made sure everything was good. And so finally, when it was time for me to go home, 
at that point, I remember I was so exhausted that I couldn't figure out how to use the door handle on the door outside <laughs> to go home. Um, because, you know, tricky door handles, tricky door handles. Uh, so yeah, three weeks of about 24 hours straight uh, shifts uh, leading up to the launch, and then on the final week, 40 hours straight. Uh, obviously, it's not something I would ever ask anyone to do these days, but, you know, it was a different time back then. <laughs> and then we started fanfares. Uh, so many of you guys know, many of you guys here have been there, but EverQuest fanfares were immersive events that connected the games community and developers. Uh, we had Q&A sessions, panels, discussions about game updates, mechanics, and lore. Attendees engaged with developers, shared experiences, and previewed upcoming content. Uh, we showcased player creativity through costume contests, while live gameplay sessions allowed the fans to interact with the designers. Uh, these events celebrated EverQuest's legacy and allowed players to connect face-to-face, -face, fostering a sense of camaraderie. Uh, we had special guest appearances and exclusive in-game rewards. We even had a wedding at one of the fanfares. Uh, Fanfares were a bridge between the virtual and real world, solidifying EverQuest's impact on players' lives beyond the screen. I even got my job at a fanfare. I had an interview in 2005 with uh, Travis McAthy, um, and then I started working on EverQuest during Depths of Dark Call, and 19 years later, I'm the manager. Uh, this year, we are having a digital forward Fippy Fest. While it's not fanfare like previous events, it is a digital event that is live streamed, so you can participate from anywhere in the world and celebrate with us. And as you know, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary. So, yeah, that brings us to the here and now, the 25th anniversary of EverQuest. So, as you all know, we're celebrating the 25th anniversary. EQ2 is celebrating the 20th anniversary, and we've dubbed it the Year of Darkfall. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to check out the infographic, but here's some interesting uh, stats from that infographic. In those 25 years, Fippy Darkpaw has been killed over 2.6 million times. That's a lot of death. <laughs> but, you know, never give up, right? <laughs> 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 you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that's... Guards. I think that includes the guards. <laughs> and, so, and, and since launch, we've added 439,000 NPCs. And remember those 70 zones that we started out with? We're now at 880 zones. So, yeah. And for you achievement hunters out there, we've added nearly 6,000 achievements to complete. I don't know about you, but... That sounds like a great challenge to me. <laughs> so, and yeah, with the Year of Dark Paw, we have a ton of events and activities in and out of the game. We have the new anniversary tower that's pictured right there. And, you know, that's featuring gameplay for most players. That's uh, focused at, uh, that starts at level 20 and then all the way up to max level 125. So wherever you are in your uh, EverQuest journey, you're more than likely going to be able to participate in this content. And, you know, we just want people to come back in and play and find old friends, maybe make new ones, and, you know, check out the tower. It's, it's completely filled with all this amazing uh, concept art from over the years. I know the first time I went through that zone, it's like, I've never seen that piece. Is that our piece? <laughs> So it's a great place, even if you just want to walk around the tower and look at all that great key art. And uh, just for logging in, uh, we have exclusive monthly giveaways in-game. For example, if you log in right now, you'll be able to get a mask worn uh, by a ghost owlbear named Graka. So it's a, great, it's a great mask. It's just a lot of fun times. And then also, because our anniversary was literally last Saturday, if you log in to EQ right now, you'll be able to get a royal silver crown, and for members, you'll be able to get a free level 100 heroic character, plus other goodies. Do, do, do I have a picture of goodies? Thank you. And then that brings me to Fippy Fest. 
Um, so touching on out of game, we'll be at a handful of events like this one, PAX East, woo woo, <laughs> woo. <laughs> and then uh, for other uh, in-person events, we have Fippy Fest. Yes, it's digital forward, but we do have a limited uh, edition number of tickets left for the very first Fippy Fest. And with your tickets, you'll get some personalized collectibles, like literally personalized with your character name and server, um, a specially curated swag bag, a studio tour, and plenty of chances for one-on-one -on -one time with the devs. It's definitely a very intimate experience uh, for the in-person aspect. We'll also have a fantasy-inspired feast at Fippy Fest, and a whole lot more. So, ah, I keep on hitting the mic. Sorry about that. <laughs> and so we've talked a lot about the past, but let's touch a little bit on the future. So yeah, we are continuing to develop EverQuest, and we're still going strong with no plans to stop anytime soon. Uh, we'll keep releasing expansions and new ways of experiencing the game as long as we can. Uh, we've already started development on this coming expansion as of last June. And the beta for the new expansion is expected to start in October to be released in December. Expect something big. Uh, Jen, what else is coming up? So let's talk a little bit about the new EverQuest game. I know some of you are super excited to uh, hear some more about that, but I don't really have a big update for you. I have a small update. Uh, we've been pitching and ideating on the next installment in the multi multiverse of EverQuest, and the project is in its infancy. So many things can change between now and when we're ready to publicly talk about it. So no, it's in development, well, not to, we don't call it in development. It's in ideation. Um, so yeah, we're continuing to work on it and see what sticks to the wall, right? <laughs> Throwing spaghetti ideas at the wall. <laughs> um, but again, project still in, in its infancy. And if you would like us, if you would like to help us out, we are hiring. So yeah, if if you think that you'd make a good fit for any one of our positions, we do have all of our uh, positions posted up on daybreakgames.com, careers. And that brings us to our Q&A. Uh, I believe we have some microphones set up. In about Where are 10 they? Minutes. In the center, yep. in the center of the aisles. Uh, yeah, so please. Go ahead. Hey. My name's Xavier Brooks. I'm a big fan. Go back to uh, original game of my friend Feld junior year twice because of Evercrack. <laughs> <laughs> His mom was always sick. So um, two questions. Um, well, I guess three now. Do you all hire remotely? Uh, any chance for a native Linux client? And where do you all see like the impact of like LLMs and AI? Do you all, if, say someone was starting out like a computer science degree today, would it be worth it to go four or five years of school and would there be a job waiting for them or would y'all see that in your, your studio as you know kind of a waste of time these days? Uh, so the first question, uh, do we hire remotely? Uh, yes, we do, but in certain states. And that is California, Washington, Texas, and New York. So if you're willing to move to one of those states or already in one of those states, then yes, you are in a place that we can hire you in. <laughs> so no Louisiana? Uh, no Louisiana. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, and the second question. Uh, Linux native client? N Linux native client. Do you want to try to tackle that, Lucy? Or? Um, okay. I think the chance is probably really low. <laughs> it's a direct X problem, isn't it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Fair. And then the third question. Uh, Do you all see oh. like large language models, AI making, trying to get into computer science and game dev useless these days? Like if I had a friend who was going to start out four or five years of college, would there be a job waiting for them when they get out? Or uh, where do you see the future of that? I mean, having a solid computer science uh, foundation is great for getting into into the gaming industry, into our teams. Um, I know a lot of our designers actually, or used to, have a degree in computer science, even though, you know, it's like, 
they're, they're writers. <laughs> um, so having a solid foundation in computer science definitely can help you and helps you think logically. Um, did you want to talk a bit about our scripting system, Adam? <laughs> I mean, our scripting system is basic. It's really very much like C uh, with like there's two, three commands and everything else is other, other, other uh, built-in functions. And you, so you really got to be able to logically fit, think of how to use these very few things. And because we have very few commands, the AI is not going to help you a lot. It'll help you a little bit, but you're going to have to know how to modify what that AI told you. And if you don't have the degree, you might not know how to do that. Fair, and if the LLM isn't trained on your own proprietary scripting language, then it can't help. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Ah. Hi, I'm Ida, AKA Secrets. How's it going? First, that, does that count as one question or do I get more three questions? I don't know how this genie <laughs> thing works. Um, first question, TLP rule sets. Where are we standing on those? What will those be? We will announce those very soon. Uh, <laughs> liter literally, our community manager is writing the rule sets into our producer's letter, which will drop, I think, in the first week of April. So we'll talk more about that at that time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, second question. How do you see the future of time lock progression servers. I know there was a mention in the AMA. Where do you see yourselves going with future rule sets in the future? I mean, we'll be willing to try new things. Um, we do listen to the player feedback. We don't always agree with the player feedback, so we won't always do exactly what you know, player that's smart. is going to say. Just to be clear, that's smart. <laughs> <laughs> I've met um, some of these players. <laughs> um, we will probably we will continue to try to innovate. We will try new things, see what sticks. Uh, the, the, for example, the mission server seems to be a very sticky idea. Um, we love so, it. I think everyone here probably loved the mission server. Yeah. Um, and the classic progressive server is still very popular, so we'll almost guarantee to continue to sometimes put out some classic progression servers. Uh, but we'll also experiment. Uh, we may experiment more with, you know. Please do. <laughs> yeah. We're excited. Player Beast is very excited. All right, last question. This is kind of like a, as of the last patch, where is Burned Woods this weekend? <laughs> uh, I think we put it next to Kelethon. <laughs> next to Kelethon? Next to Kelethon. OK, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you for your time. <laughs> So speaking of player feedback, can you tell me how many expansions will it take before the Dark Elves finally roll over the lesser races of Noreth? <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's a never-ending struggle. <laughs> yeah. It's like, quash, like pulling weeds is what it is. Yeah. Hi. So I'm a developer myself, and the oldest code base I ever worked on was about 10 years old. Um, and with a code base as old as EverQuest, I can imagine there are a lot, or all of the original development team has probably left the company by this point. Is, have you ever come across something while you're trying to fix a bug or trying to add a new feature where you just go like, oh my gosh, why would you do it like that? Um, yeah, all the time. <laughs> um, I think a funny anecdote would be in, in the code that handles time, so when you type slash time in EQ, uh, there's a whole bunch of all caps, really angry comments about why would, what kind of alien slug beast uses 25 hours in a day? <laughs> because the, I guess apparently it's like hours zero through 24, which is actually 25 hours. But yeah, it's, it happens all the time. I've looked at my own scripts from 15 years ago and wondered what the heck I was thinking. <laughs> Thank you. Oh dear. Um, uh, hi. Uh, sorry, I'm just nervous. Um, EverQuest art book. Uh, EverQuest art book one. I, I, I've been begging for one. I, even a PDF would be cool. I'd pay for it. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we're going to come up with a new release for an art book anytime soon. Um, we did have one on the 10th anniversary, right? Yeah, I, got, I got that one, yeah. Yeah, and I don't know. We'll keep it in mind. <laughs> Hey, uh, thanks for running this. I really appreciate it, and I, I think uh, it's great that you, you all do this. Uh, what was the, uh, how long did the original Lair of the Split Paul run? That zone has changed a lot throughout the game, and I think that was the first major dungeon revamp. I don't recall. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to say I don't recall off okay. the top of my head. I got another funny question. Who would win in a fight, uh, Venril, Sathir, or Mayong Mismore? Unfortunately, Mayong. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, yeah. Hey, you can't beat him, man. Not even with that open robe, man. Hey, thanks. Okay. Hello, my question is uh, related to commas and the bazaar and <laughs> the cat. <laughs> that is the question. Um, so one of our programmers, Miko, is super excited about adding commas to things, so I'm sure it'll happen soon. Hi there. Just wanted to ask, what's your design principle towards kind of in this day of the age of having GMs being an active presence in-game versus a world where AI bots and workplace optimization, the cost of people, is the pressure and the norm? Well, we don't keep them in mind as much as we should. We concentrate a lot on the stories. Um, we do try to leave a little space for our GMs, um, but the story is really the king. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Uh, hi. I was a day one player on EQ1, and um, I, I was there in 03 as a member of Ascending Dawn when the sleeper fell. Uh, awesome. And um, my, my biggest concern right now is moving forward for, like, future games or future expansions, is there any way that you're planning to keep in check like the, the constant botters and uh, like uh, platformers and things like that that have kind of destroyed a lot of the economy for uh, new or returning gamers that may have taken a break for a while and came back to everything being extravagantly overpriced? Well, I'm going to start with, we don't like them either, right? Uh, obviously, they are not great for the community building aspects of our game, um, but it is a constant, you know, it's, it's an arms race for us. Um, certainly, we don't want people to be doing things like this, and we're constantly trying to figure out ways uh, to kind of squash down a lot of that as best as we can. I know that we are working on some research projects internally to try to make a big dent. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about any of that, Lucy, or just leave it at that. Um, I know I cannot feel like things don't happen fast enough or the cheaters just come back. It is very frustrating for me personally. Um, I would say that we do work on it all the time, even when it feels like nothing is happening. Um, a lot of the people who bought an EQ are very heavily invested in avoiding detection and they can spend all of their time on that. And our development team only spends part of our time on anti-cheat things. So usually they stay, unfortunately they have been staying one step ahead of us in more recent times. But we do have things coming this year that should hopefully help. And our time is up, so I'm sorry we can't take any more questions. Uh, that concludes our panel. So for those of you from the press, please get in touch with Joy Fox here. She's waving her hand. And thank you all for coming. Um, as you walk out. <laughs> thank you. As you walk out, uh, right back there, there's Steven waving his hand. Please uh, get some uh, in-game loot. We do have cards for some in-game loot, as well as uh, these great Year of Dark Paw pins. Thanks for coming, everybody.